Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to many of you who have been with us here all day at the UHC Pavilion. I am Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX. This has been a really exciting day. It's kind of an experiment. It's our first time hosting a pavilion like this. And really, we did it because we thought with the official summit yesterday, the new declaration on UHC, it would be important for the global health community to have a place to come and gather and keep the momentum going. We know that getting a big declaration on UHC is a real political success, but a lot of the hard work is yet to be done, and we've got to keep the momentum. So this has been a day of really exciting conversations with leaders of all kinds from all stripes and backgrounds, um, and I think we've had some, some real insights that have come out of it today. So I want to thank all of you who are in the room, and I want to thank the, the many people who are following this online. Thank you for being a part of the discussion as well. We've got a really exciting session now with Peter Sands. Um, you know, this, as I mentioned, is just a day after the political declaration, and we're also just three weeks before the replenishment convening. 16 days before uh, this gentleman will be in Lyon, France, hopefully standing on a stage and announcing something like $14 billion committed to the fight against malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV AIDS. So this is a really important moment for the Global Fund, and we were excited to get a chance to, to pull him and his team away from a very busy UN General Assembly week. Uh, this is a week where athleticism matters. I'm sure all of you have been running around. Uh, this is a gentleman who's been doing that all over the world for the last uh, several months to raise this money. So looking forward to that conversation. But first, I want to bring up a partner of ours at DevX, uh, an organization that has underwritten this event and made it possible. That's USP, uh, US Pharmacopeia. They're a longstanding partner of ours at DevX and actually a partner probably of many of you. And you may not even know it because they often are in the background of a lot of the health systems in the world. When we think of UHC, uh, there are three elements. You know, there's access. We, that's the one most people understand. There's affordability. We don't want people to go bankrupt, just have access to health care. But the third big one is quality. Quality is a really tough one. And that's what USP works on. Um, and they ensure that for many of us here in the U.S. and in Canada and Europe, if you go into a pharmacy, you don't really have to think about the quality of what you're getting. That is not the case in many countries in the world that have weaker health systems. And they're working really hard to change that. So we're delighted to have them as an underwriter for this event, and I wanted to ask Ron Pierre Vincenzi to come up and just give us some opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, sound check? Um, so I was speaking with Melanie Brooks of the Global Fund just a few minutes ago, and she told me I should tell a story instead of giving opening remarks. So I'm going to take her advice. I'll tell a story. Uh, USP was founded uh, 200 years ago, actually 199 and 10 months ago. Uh, to do one thing, which was to improve the quality of medicines at that time in the United States. Uh, Eleven physicians got together and declared an end to uh, what was at the time an epidemic of, of, of really quite, quite poor medicine and inconsistent across the country that was not treating disease um, and was actually diminishing trust amongst the population. So in the context of universal health care, while that was certainly not even, a, uh, I think, a vision in 1820, there was a sense that at least there had to be certain steps. Um, and from when it comes to the, the context of quality medicine, at that time, the pledge was really on two fronts. The first was to create some kind of essentially self-regulation to increase the quality of medicines at that time, especially um, uh, in, for imported medicines. And two, to then begin to work with the manufacturers, of course, the manufacturers at that time were physicians themselves, not even yet the pharmacists to a large degree, producing the medicines. The last thing I would reflect on is at that time, the U.S. was very reliant on European medicines, especially coming from uh, England. And England was sending across its poorest medicines that were deemed good enough. In fact, there were bottles labeled, there were photographs labeled good enough for the U.S. Uh, and it's, it's a true story, and the parallels today are not that hard to see. Uh, organizations like the Global Fund, that I look forward to hearing Peter Sands speak, um, are quite obviously in a different place on that front. Um, and in fact, I would argue, with our work that we do with the Global Fund, going quite the opposite way, which is setting the bar for what good looks like in the areas that Global Fund is supporting, and making a definition and supporting the evolution of both the regulatory agencies who help preserve that quality of medicine in a given marketplace, as well as the manufacturers. And once they learn how to do that for a certain medicine, they start to get a bit hooked on that, and they realize that making quality medicines like this can become a competitive advantage. Those companies start to succeed. They start to produce medicines for the local market. They even start to export, create jobs, create quality medicine. And it becomes a very, uh, very quick virtuous cycle. 
although it's not written into the global fund and it's not measured as their impact, it's actually another aspect that we see happen. So it's our great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Raj. I look forward to hearing uh, the interview with, uh, with Peter. Um, and thank you all. We look forward to January 1st when we celebrate our uh, 200th anniversary. We think we're the oldest non-church, non, um, non non-educational, continue operating entity uh, in the U.S. But of course, by global standards, we're still quite young. Thank you. for the ongoing partnership that we, we have had. I want to hand the stage over to a colleague of mine who many of you know well, at least you know his byline. If you haven't had a chance to, to see or meet him in person, that's Michael Igo. He's a senior reporter at DevX. Uh, he is widely read in the halls of Congress, over here in the UN system and the World Bank and all over the world for his insightful commentary and journalism around what's happening uh, and the biggest issues and trends of our day. So delighted to give him a, the stage here to, to lead a conversation with Peter Sands. Please join us. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Peter. Thank you. So at the risk of self-promotion, I, I just wanted to read something from an article uh, we wrote on DevX about your predecessor, Mark Dybul, a couple of years ago. And this is what we wrote. Dybul told me he would have liked to stay at the Global Fund for another year or two, but could never ask a new executive director to come on board without time to prepare for the next replenishment, especially given how difficult the next replenishment is going to be. <laughs> Do you feel like he gave you enough time to prepare? What I would say is, and I love Mark dearly, that's not exactly how he sold it to me. <laughs> In fact, I wish he had told me that first. It's pretty hard work doing a replenishment. So let's talk about the work. In January, the Global Fund announced a replenishment target of $14 billion to support your next three years of work. We've seen the pledges and commitments start rolling in. Um, the replenishment conference is happening, as you are very well aware, in 16 days in Lyon. What has this experience been like? How are you feeling about it at this point? Will we hear $14 billion in Lyon? <clears throat> Well, to start with, I'm, I'm not going to count my chickens. A lot of things have to happen in the next 16 days, and the stakes are pretty high. Um, we reckon with at least $14 billion, we can save at least 16 million lives over the next three years. So this is, you know, this is serious stuff. Um, actually, we're not in a bad place. Um, we're in a pretty good place. Of the G7 countries which provide the lion's share of our funding. Um, five of the seven have already made pledges. So you have pledges like the UK up 16, Germany up 18, these are percentages. Um, Italy up 15%, the European Commission up 15%, Japan up 5%, um, so Canada up 16. Um, the two missing are the United States, but actually you've got bills that have come out of both the House and the Senate, both up 15.6%. Um, we just need to pass them. We just need to pass them, but it's, it's, it's very good having that strength of really bipartisan congressional support. Um, so we're, we're enormously appreciative of that support. Um, and, and France, um, and you would expect France to um, make its announcement at Lyon, given that France um, and President Macron um, is the host. Um, and so our focus here uh, at the UNGA is very much um, on uh, the, m the large number of middle-sized donors. Um, some of the other European countries, countries in the Middle East, countries elsewhere in the world. Um, and, and actually, the investment case unit that we launched in January um, uh, has, had a, has had a very good reception. Uh, people aren't arguing with us about the case. People understand the case is very compelling. Um, it's more a question of whether governments feel like they have the money. And it's not just about governments. We're also targeting about a billion dollars 
um, out of the 14 to come from the private sector. Um, and we've already had a number of pledges um, from the private sector. So still a lot to do, but actually we have some pretty good momentum as we go into this last couple of weeks. And that the private sector pledge, I believe your, your current funding from the private sector is something like 7% of the global funds total. Yeah. I, this represents a substantial increase, is that correct, the, on the private sector side? $1 billion would... $1 billion would be... would, is, a, is a bigger increase than the 15% increase we're targeting for the entire amount. So the 2016 replenishment was 12.2 billion. This we're targeting 14. And the the private sector increase is bigger. It it won't materially change. It may push it up from seven to seven and a half or eight um, percent. Uh, but I think the percentage actually understates the importance of the private sector contribution. A lot of our private sector partners um, add value in ways beyond just the money they contribute to us. So whether it's in um, data analytics or um, supply chain expertise or in marketing and communications expertise, um, we draw on our private sector partners for a lot of different types of capability. And as you're pushing the private sector to get involved in those kinds of ways and to get involved more deeply, have you found that the global fund needs to change itself to be a better partner to the private sector at the same time? I think um, the global fund actually, of all the global health institutions, probably does more and is sort of more inclined to do more with the private sector than any other. Um, I, I would say that I think the global health community um, hasn't done a particularly good job um, at engaging the private sector. There's a lot of mistrust and misunderstandings between the private sector and the global health community. Um, and, and personally, I think we need to find ways of changing that because if we really want to accelerate progress towards the SDG3 goals and UHC, I, I think we need the resources, skills, and capabilities of the private sector more actively engaged. Say more about that. Where do you see the, the flash points? Is it just as something as simple as two communities that haven't typically worked together trying to understand each other's language? Or is it, are there specific issues that you see sort of um, serving, driving a wedge between the, the private sector and the global health community? Oh, well, look, there's loads of issues. Drug pricing, access to um, drugs, um, the whole history of the tobacco uh, dispute. Um, I think, though, what we've got to find a way of working with doing is, is being able to engage the private sector while simultaneously challenging and disagreeing with them. Um, and I think it's something that the climate change community, I think, has done rather better. Um, than the um, global health community. When I look at what the climate change community has done, um, it has actually reached out to power companies, mining companies, airlines, people who are actually, in some ways, causing quite a lot of the problem, and simultaneously worked with them and challenged them. And, and I would like to see us in the global health community doing more of that. And I'll, I'll give you a little um, stat, which... I think exemplifies the difference. Uh, I did, well, actually, um, uh, a, a rather unfortunate research assistant working with me did um, um, an analysis of um, the uh, annual reports of the Fortune 500 companies and looked at how many of them had explicit strategies and metrics around environment and the climate change and how many of them had explicit strategies and metrics around global health. And I think, off the top of my head, and we, we, we measured a whole bunch of different things, but roughly one high-level number um, was about 72% of them had environment and climate change strategies. And about 10% of them had global health strategies. And if you took out the pharma industry, virtually none of them had global health strategies. And, and this wasn't the case 10, 15 years ago. The reality is, is that 
the climate change environment community worked with and challenged the corporate sector, and not just those directly involved in the environment, but all types of companies, to think about and get engaged with environmental issues. I don't think we have yet managed to achieve that um, in the health arena. The climate, it strikes me that the climate change community also managed to make a business case. And the health community is doing that. I mean, I know that the, you are doing that. You're making a business case for investing in controlling three global epidemics. Um, how can we do that more effectively? Is it just a, uh, an ask, a, a question of getting more of the health community on board and driving that message, the financial message? Is, or is there something else that needs to be done, perhaps working with finance ministers or something like that? Yeah, in, in a sense, I think that's a, a somewhat different problem because actually I think the investment case for investing in global health is absolutely compelling. I mean, when you come like me from outside the health sector um, and look at the returns on investment in health, they're sort of ridiculous. They're so high. Um, I mean, we calculated that the investments um, we're making um, have a return of $19 to one. Uh, the Gates Foundation looked at its investments, of which a large share are through us or through Gavi, and came up with 20 to one. So, you know, okay, we disagree by a dollar, but when you're making 19 or $20 to every one. Now, actually, people in the business world are thrilled when they get 19 cents extra on a dollar, right? That's, that's a good return. So the idea that you get $19 extra is just extraordinary. Um, so the, now the problem, of course, is that the benefits are diffuse and they're not captured by the person making um, the investment. Um, so I, I absolutely we need to engage with um, finance ministers more. But I think much of the issue around um, engagement with the private sector is of people not really understanding, A, what each other can bring, but also not understanding each other's constraints um, and, and what it is that a company has to do to survive, um, what a company has, what it can and can't do. And, and so I, I think there are a lot of mutual misunderstandings there. So you've been deeply involved in, in the policy discussions here at the UN and elsewhere on universal health coverage. Are those conversations happening? Are, are those synergies starting to come together? Um, or are we still a ways off, do you think? Actually, I think the universal health coverage discussions are a real positive because they um, are forcing a level of ambition about what we should be doing with health. I do think, though, there is a danger that we focus um, a little too much on universal health coverage itself, which is a means rather than the end, which is health and well-being um, for all. Um, the other thing that I'm uh, very focused on in talking about uh, UHC is, is the U bit. Um, it's much easier to create a health coverage system that covers the people who have salaries, who live in the cities, um, and or work for the government or whatever. Um, but if you truly mean it about leaving no one behind and creating true universal health coverage, it doesn't happen automatically. Um, you, you have to break down the barriers that prevent communities who are criminalized, discriminated against, stigmatized from accessing health care. You have to take positive action to reach out to the places which are more remote, harder to get to, um, the most impoverished um, communities. So in my view, we have to make sure that, in a sense, the UHC does the difficult bit first, that really reaches out to those who are most vulnerable. Um, and so the, when, when we think about our involvement in UHC, that's one of the aspects of UHC we are most focused on. Yeah, and I mean, this was my next question, and I think one of the, the big questions out here. The Global Fund was not created to be a UHC uh, fund, necessarily. You were created with a, a fairly specific mandate to tackle three specific diseases. So, I mean, as the as global attention shifts towards UHC, um, as the goals sort of expand and broaden in this way, 
what role does your institution play in that conversation, but also in specifically implementing programs with sort of this dual UHC and keeping an eye on, on the three, three diseases that you're created to, uh, to defeat? Well, I think the starting point we have to recognize is that the Global Fund's role has already evolved, right? When the Global Fund was created in 2002, nobody was talking about ending the epidemics. People were just saying, we have a disaster on our hands. Stop so many people dying. It was, a, it was a really sort of simple, well, not simple to do, but it was a very clear mandate to stop people dying. And it was only when we started to make significant progress on that, and our latest results report um, set estimates that we cumulatively saved 32 million lives. Just quickly, to put that into context, I looked this up. 20 million people died in World War I. Yeah. So 32 million lives throughout the life of the Global Fund is, which is pretty extraordinary. Years. It is pretty extraordinary. And another way of, put it, another way of thinking of it, which um, only occurred to me today, actually, was um, last year's figure was 27 million. This year's figure is 32 million. The difference between those two numbers is 5 million, um, which works out as... 433,000 people a month. That kind of focuses the mind a bit um, as somebody who's running the Global Fund. Um, uh, and it makes me think, you know, the difference between running this organization to maximum impact and sub-optimizing anyway is... Has a has a really significant um, impact. That's a bit of pressure. It is a bit of pressure. Um, it's both. I mean, a privilege to be in a position to have such impact, but it also means there's a huge responsibility on us um, to make sure that every dollar we have goes in a way that maximizes that impact. But I, I've, we got slightly off track. Um, I want to come back to the point that already we have evolved because originally we were just fighting the fire of too many people dying. And then as we got to make more progress and the death rate started coming down, and roughly speaking, the death rate across all three diseases has halved. Um, we've now said it's not enough just to bring down, in a sense, the run rate of death. We've got to be more ambitious. We've got to end the epidemics, because actually that is the way of saving countless future lives. And so, and that's a, that's a big strategic shift, and that predates me. Um, so already the Global Fund has evolved. Now, as you say, the context is changing in the context of the SDGs and the broader UHC agenda. Um, and absolutely, we're taking um, that on board, um, because simply saving people's lives from the three diseases and then having them die of something else clearly isn't enough. Right? Um, we've got to work in a way that contributes to the broader goal of health and well-being and the broader functioning of the health system. And I'll just highlight three things about the way we do this. One, one, is that I, one thing that I think the Global Fund brings to the UHC debate, which is distinctive, is our focus on the UBIT and on, on including the excluded, on reaching out to the marginalized, the criminalized, the stigmatized, those left behind. That includes, actually, in many countries, women who are often disadvantaged in their accesses, access to health services, or particularly vulnerable um, to infection, most obviously HIV. Um, let's not forget that the leading killer globally of women aged between 15 and 49 is HIV, that 1,000 young women are infected with HIV every day and are two to six times as likely to be infected. So that's one aspect. A second aspect is, frankly, by ending the epidemics of HIV, TB, and malaria, we can free health systems of burdens that in many countries still completely dominate and overwhelm everything that that health system um, uh, is doing. I mean, I've been to general purpose clinics in Mozambique where, in theory, they 
had a lot of services. In practice, 90% of what was going on was HIV. And similarly, I have seen community health workers in villages in different countries, most recently in Mali and Niger, where actually all they did was malaria. If you can, if you can reduce the burden of these diseases, you actually create capacity um, in the system. I think the third thing we do, which is um, distinctive, is, is around the engagement of communities. Uh, one thing that marks the Global Fund out is that the engagement of communities is not just something that happens at the programming level. It's something that happens all the way through the structure and the governance. I mean, for example, um, there aren't many organizations in the world where communities of affected people sit on the board with the same voting power as our largest donor. Um, and, and that engagement of communities is, I think, a, a really important aspect of um, UHC. It shouldn't be something that happens to communities, is done to them. It should be something that's designed by and owned by and involves them in a very, in a very substantive way. I noticed in looking at some of the replenishment pledges that have been made so far, here are a few of your, your donors this year. India, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, Zambia, Namibia. Um, this is not a, the typical set of global health donors. What does it bring to the fund, not just in terms of the pot of money? Um, I mean, you mentioned the importance of bringing sort of the, the middle donors in, and, and that really is providing a lot of, of funding. Um, but to have this sort of global representation among the countries and governments that are providing you with funds, having some voice, as you say, what does that, what does that do for the fund in terms of its effectiveness, in terms of its governance and identity? I think it's hugely important. Um, I think it's hugely important that we have implemented governments who are on our board, who are actually donors to us, although they're massively net recipients, um, because it creates a sense of accountability and ownership um, that is very powerful. And um, ultimately, ultimately, it is the countries and the governments of those countries that are going to defeat these epidemics, that are going to build UHC, that are going to deliver SDG3. It's not the multilaterals. The multilaterals can act as enablers and can help. Um, and absolutely, we, we have a, an important role to it. But we need them to take ownership and, uh, and, and leadership. And I think by them being involved in the way we are governed and funded, that's part of that that leadership. And I'm also curious, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of the Global Fund's general position, outlook, uh, security in a changing political and financial context? When you can have that sort of global buy-in, when you're not just talking about a few small donors, does that insulate you from some of the the turmoil that we're seeing this year, in recent years, um, and a general backlash against, or skepticism, I suppose, of, of multilateral initiatives? I'm not sure it feels like being insulated. Um, uh, what I would say is, uh, when I first went to a Global Fund board meeting, and there were something like 300 people there, I thought, well, this isn't quite what I'm used to. <laughs> um, and um, the, the dynamics of our governance are immensely complex because we have technical partners, donors, implementer governments, private sector, civil society, a multitude of different perspectives. And we have some very tough trade-offs um, because, yes, we have in a sense, more money than any other entity in global health. But compared to the scale of the need, it is clearly not enough. And um, so that collection of different interests has to make through our governance system some very difficult trade-offs. And 
the winds of political interest and focus and things absolutely influence um, the way people are thinking about things. I mean, it would be surprising if um, uh, they didn't. But what it gives us, and it's a, uh, what it gives us having this very inclusive governance structure is also this very broad sense of ownership and support for the fund. Um, and that, I do think, um, is, is a huge um, strength um, for the Global Fund. I'm also very struck by the fact that um, in many of our donor countries, the support for the Global Fund is completely bipartisan. And that certainly gives us resilience in an, at a time when you've got lots of ebbs and flows in political currents in um, different countries. Having strong bipartisan support um, is, is, a, is a great strength. I wanted to talk quickly about one health challenge that I think is probably on everyone's mind and, and relates to universal health coverage and, and relates to what the Global Fund works on, but is not directly at the, the core of your mandate. Um, and that's pandemic preparedness and, and outbreaks and the fact that we're sitting here in the midst of the second largest Ebola outbreak in history. Where do you see the, the fund's role in that, in addressing that challenge? How does that challenge relate both to universal health coverage, the, the topic that we're talking about today, um, but also this decades-long fight to defeat three epidemics? It's a really good question. Um, and uh, before I came to the Global Fund, uh, I was doing a bunch of work for the Harvard Global Health Institute. I was based there. And I actually did some work on pandemics for both the US National Academy and um, the World Bank. And I was, I, my background is economics and finance. I'm not a scientist or a clinician, but um, I did a, a bunch of work there. And the thing that always slightly puzzled me was the category definition of what counted as a pandemic or endemic threat and what didn't. And basically, if it was something that was killing you now, it didn't count. And if it was something that might kill you, it did count. And I thought that was a bit strange at the time. Um, and I now think it's even stranger. And I actually, more than not strange, I don't think it's sustainable. Um, because the, from, a, from a moral point of view, but also from a practical point of view, um, most global health security conversations would exclude something like malaria. But you can't go to a community which is afflicted by malaria and say, yes, I know you've got malaria, but please can you spend money on something that might turn up, and we're particularly worried about it, because if it does, it might impact us. I mean, that does not go down very well. Um, As and, we've seen. Yeah, yeah. and, and you, you get that reaction. I mean. Tedros has told me he's heard that reaction, say, in, in Kivu, in DRC. Um, and, and so you don't build trust with communities if you have a highly selective attitude as to what you're going to be worried about. The second point is, is it's just not sensible. It's not practical. The things you do to fight an endemic disease like malaria, the disease surveillance, the community health workers, the laboratory networks, all that sort of, are exactly the things you need to prevent against other diseases. And indeed, if you look at what's happening um, in the current Ebola outbreak, a lot of the diagnostics are being done with diagnostic, molecular diagnostic kits that we invested in for TB. A lot of the disease surveillance is done on the basis of systems that we invested in for the not just TB, but malaria and HIV. Um, and, and so the the, the systems, the infrastructure, the capabilities that you need to fight endemic diseases, the things that are actually killing people now, actually give you the response mechanisms um, for things that are, in a sense, new um, threats. And I think we've got to kind of get smarter, and that includes us at the Global Fund. We've got to get smarter at saying, what are the things we're doing in fighting these diseases that if we did them a little bit differently, could give us that extra health security um, uh, protection. Um, and we need, to, we need to sort of break down this rather artificial distinction 
um, between efforts to deal with the endemic diseases and efforts to build health security. And what does that look like on the, the financing side? Does that mean that the institutions that exist today, like the Global Fund, just need to be resourced well enough to sort of add something like this to their mandate and to adapt in ways that are responsive to pandemics? Um, or do we need new financing mechanisms? I mean, there's been a lot of attention on the World Bank's Pandemic Emergency Fund, which has gotten some criticism. It seems like it's really challenging to stand up these funds quickly when there is an outbreak. But maybe that's, it sounds like what you're saying is maybe that's not even necessary. Maybe the institutions are already in place. Well, um, to start, my starting point would be I'm not sure the global health world needs new institutions. Um, I mean, uh, I think most people who are new to the global health world, and even those who've been around the global health world, find it quite confusing to explain what it is that everybody does and how you interrelate with each other. So that would be my starting point biases. Let's not invent too many new um, uh, institutions. Um, the first thing is, by far the best thing to do is um, invest in preparedness. And actually, pandemic emergency facility so is designed to solve one kind of problem, which is the quick release of money after an outbreak. Personally, I think that's an easier problem, and I'm less fussed about it. The bigger problem is how do you make systems more resilient in the first place and prevent things, and it's much harder to get um, money for that. Um, one of the things I've done since I've been at the Global Fund is I actually asked um, Georgetown to take a look at um, the programs we were running in... Um, three countries and analyze them against the 48 component parts. Sorry about that. Um, the 48 component parts of the peer reviewing of the, um, what's it called? I've forgotten what it's called. The, um, uh, the, there's, a, the, the, there's an index of preparedness um, and it has an acronym which I've forgotten. Um, right. But anyway, there's, a, there's an index of preparedness which has 48 component parts, and basically lots of countries have done it and have essentially developed a diagnostic of where they have gaps in their preparedness, but what they haven't done is then actually spend any money fixing things. And what I wanted to know was how much of the things that we are doing anyway are actually addressing some of the deficiencies. And actually what came out of that is something like 30-something percent of what we're doing is directly addressing weaknesses in countries' um, pandemic preparedness. Now, we're, we're actually deepening and extending that because that's without deliberately planning on doing it. What I want to now understand is if we were more deliberately programming to have um, a collateral benefit, so I don't want to lose our focus on the three diseases, but if we can do things a bit smarter so that it has a collateral benefit to improve um, preparedness to pandemics, that would seem to me like a really, really good thing um, to do. So that's the next phase of um, work we're doing right now. Great. All right, well, Peter, you've thrown a lot out there for us to, to think about. I'd love to take some questions from the audience at this point. We've got about 15 minutes, I think, and uh, would love to hear questions or comments. Yes, right here. And let me see if we have a microphone going around. Why don't I get oh. Thank you for that um, enlightening conversation. I'm Adeze Ore from Nigeria's Ministry of Health. And I like the, the fact you highlighted the Ebola crisis in Kivu, which is really scary. I mean, Nigeria was um, part of the largest Ebola crisis in between 2013 and 2016. And um, I wanted you to, if you could, um, share light on how you think governments can, when receiving funds for vertical programs, um, standalone diseases like HIV, AIDS, and malaria, using some of those funds to build the systems in terms of the capacity, people who are trained in combating those diseases. Because I think the, the future of preparedness in terms of epidemics is making sure that the community systems are in place to both treat endemic diseases and identify those epidemics when they do 
um, present. So if you could please shed some light on that. <laughs> we can do a, it's like a musical mics. We're, we are very happy to see uh, countries using our funds in intelligent ways to b build, to, to fight HCB in ways that helps them build their border preparedness. Um, and remember, the way um, the Global Fund works is we don't tell countries what to do. We will tell a country like Nigeria that you will have X hundred million over the next three years. Um, and then the CCM, the country coordinating mechanism, actually prioritizes and with support, and we do provide support, um, actually comes up with the applications for grants and the programming that is prioritized. Um, and then it goes through kind of technical review and all that kind of stuff, and we end up um, funding a program. Um, but, but we are very open to seeing the kind of thing um, you're talking about. In fact, we'd like to see more of it. Um, uh, and, and so we will be um, encouraging um, countries in this cycle to be thinking about the broader systemic benefits that can be achieved through the programming that we're going to be funding. Um, and this is, this is a real opportunity that is, I mean, assuming we're successful, um, um, on the 10th of October, we will move very rapidly into the programming cycle that will then be money invested over 21, 22, 23. Great question. Others? Yes, sir. We got one. I'm on the board of the Access to Medicine Foundation, which looks at access to medicine, by which we mean pharmaceuticals, for um, basically low-income countries and basically the Southern Hemisphere. We increasingly face criticism, given the amount of in-country inequality, that we are not looking at issues like university, universal health care and access in the middle-income countries and even in the high-income countries. We have not figured out what to do about it. Is, has the Global Fund looked at it, and are you thinking about it? Uh, because it, it's real, and inequality is increasing, and the problem is increasing in country. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good point, and it's a significant problem. Um, uh, I'm afraid to say I don't have a, 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 an immediate answer um, either. We are focused on it in, um, we're, we are particularly focused because of our mandate on access to antiretrovirals, TB medicines um, in middle income countries, particularly for key populations who often have, who can have constrained access um, to health services. And um, in some countries it is the case that um, because of all sorts of issues, the quality of medicines is lower, um, the price being paid is higher. Um, and so our focus here is um, actually the thing we're, we're, we're trying to do and we're putting a lot of effort in right now is enabling countries to have access to our procurement systems. Um, because we procure at huge scale through very transparent mechanisms and obviously to high standards of quality and low prices because of um, the scale. Um, it's already the case that through the Global Drug Facility that countries can access international pool procurement um, anyway. What we're now doing is through our WAMBO platform um, is piloting opening up access for countries to buy other sorts of um, medicines like antiretrovirals um, in the same way. That doesn't solve the entirety. Your problem is broader than that. But certainly in those areas, this is a, we see as a, a sort of pragmatic way of ensuring that, in a sense, countries, even when they are funding it and we are not, don't have an excuse not 
to go for the, the high quality, lowest cost uh, medicines if we are making our platforms available to them. WAMBO, by the way, being probably my favorite acronym in the global health space. That's a brilliant one. I'm not even sure what it's an acronym. Neither am I, to be I'm, honest. I'm not even sure it's an acronym. I think it's, it's, Is a, it just a, it's a Swahili it's word. Just, oh, really? It's just a word. Um, well, but for Wembo, for those of you who don't know what it is, is it's a procurement, it's an electronic online procurement platform um, that automates a lot of the um, often quite complex stages in the international procurement process and also makes them completely transparent, um, which both of which are important things to do. Other questions? Hello, um, my name is Carol from Uganda, and I just wanted to get your view on how the Global Fund is examining the balance between investing in commodities versus health systems, particularly when some countries have challenges in spending um, health system grants. It's a very good question. Um, the, the answer is that there isn't a generic answer that fits all countries. Um, uh, and this is why um, the, the country coordinating mechanism, the CCM, plays such a, uh, a critical role. Um, if I take um, uh, HIV, for example, um, in some countries like um, Nigeria, for example, our funding is highly commoditized. Um, and that's a deliberate decision by the National AIDS Program that we can access and ensure supply of high quality antiretrovirals at considerably lower cost than would be achieved if it was done um, domestically. If I take South Africa um, as a counterexample, South Africa has developed um, a very large scale and effective um, HIV antiretroviral procurement program, they buy mostly themselves. Our money in um, um, South Africa is mainly focused on the prevention side um, of uh, the HIV, the, the battle against HIV. Um, so our um, fundamental philosophy is that we want to work with the CCMs to work out where is the best use of global fund money in the specific circumstances of the individual country. Now, you highlighted specifically health systems, and I think you're right that um, many countries have struggled to focus on exactly how and where to do value-added um, investments um, in health systems. That said, quite, you know, quite a lot has been done. I mean, when I look at, um, we, we're spending about a billion dollars a year um, on health systems. Um, uh, so a lot of that goes into uh, community health workers. And when, when we fund community health workers, they're not just turning up at a village to do malaria. They will have rehydration salts for diarrhea. They'll have antibiotics for pneumonia. You know, they are... and. Increasingly, what I've seen is where malaria has come under control, they start doing all sorts of other things. Um, I recently went to a village in Ethiopia where actually I ended up being involved in a Gavi launch of a measles vaccination program managed by a community health worker that we had put in for malaria, which is actually great because it's testimony to the fact that actually the malaria was no longer much of a problem. Um, uh, but also um, significant investments in supply chain. Um, Having effective supply chains um, is um, a huge issue um, in many of the poorest countries in the world. Um, and increasingly, I don't think this was true um, if we wind back the clock several years, but certainly the focus of all our investments on supply chains now is essentially on essential medicine supply chain. They're not narrowly focused on HIV, TB, um, uh, and malaria. And then there's a whole bunch of things like disease surveillance systems, laboratory networks, um, national health care is incredibly important. 
all these different elements, all these building blocks to health systems um, uh, that you need. Governance is a big issue, um, uh, uh, and investing in governance, and indeed, I would argue that in, in some countries, CCMs have become actually quite a, uh, an important part of the health system um, governance infrastructure. I have a quick follow-up question on that. I mean, you just described a, a sort of situation where it sounds like the Global Fund's engagement in a country can be very adaptive, it's very country-specific. If a challenge turns out to be not as big of a challenge as you previously thought, then the country might work on something else. How do you get the leeway, the sort of space to, um, to adapt your programs in that way? And at the same time, sort of keep your promises to donors who are expecting certain things. This is a big issue in the sort of US aid space that I cover a lot, where you know the systems are fairly rigid. You have to do exactly what you set out to what you said that you would set out to do. If you don't, there are all sorts of accountability mechanisms in place and, and risk aversion. I mean, how do you have that that ability to adapt to the situation? I, it's a really good question, and I, I've been struck by the fact. Um, uh, as a relative newcomer, that uh, the Global Fund is actually remarkably adaptive. Um, uh, I wouldn't say the adaptation process is always the smoothest and easiest. Um, there are often very sort of intense and passionate fights at board committees and so on um, as we work out what and how to do something. Um, but the reality is, I mean, there's, there are lots of different examples of creative things. So, for example, um, uh, mine workers in southern Africa are particularly vulnerable to TB. And trying to organize treatment programs for them on a national basis makes no sense because they spend several weeks in the mine and then they go back to Mozambique or Zambia or whatever um, place and spend a few weeks there and then go back again. And if you've got a nationally based treatment program, that doesn't work. So we created a, 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 a regional mine worker TB program. Um, we've done similar things um, for refugees and displaced people um, because, of, because, again, trying to, do, trying to meet the needs of refugees who are, again, often much more vulnerable than others to particularly TB um, doesn't work. So you need a regional um, uh, program. Uh, and uh, just one more example, in the Mekong Delta. Um, Mekong Delta is where we're seeing the, the greatest levels of artemisinin-resistant malaria. And, and that's a very worrying development because um, it means that the, the best drug we have for treating malaria is less effective. Um, we have seen virtually none of that, not quite none, but virtually none of that in Africa. But the, the consequences of having that level of artemisinin resistance in Africa would be not good. Um, and so we are very focused on trying to basically eliminate malaria in the Mekong as fast as possible. Now, trying to do that on a country by country basis, particularly because the way malaria works is it tends to be um, it tends to be strongest in the places furthest away from the capital, which are often the border areas. Um, we, so we, the whole program is run on a regional um, basis because of the nature of the epidemiology. Um, so it's, it's one of the things I think is a great strength of the Global Fund, is that when we're confronted with a problem, um, we sort of scratch our heads and say, how can we make our model work in a way that solves that? Um, uh, issue. And, it, and I suppose it's because we're, the fundamental focus of the Global Fund is on the outcome, is are we saving lives, are we reducing infections, and you know, how do we problem solve to get to, to, to that outcome? I think we have time for one more question, because I cheated and stole yours. So yes, sir, in the back. Just love your perspective on progress on TB. What are some of the inherent challenges? So progress on TB. Or TB and current challenges. Um, well, the starting point is we haven't made enough progress on TB. 
um, a, uh, the, my sort of first reflection when I came into the Global Fund was um, uh, we've made fantastic progress on HIV, still more to do, fantastic progress on malaria, still more to do. W why haven't we made more progress on TB? And that's not to say we haven't made progress on TB, but um, we're nowhere near sort of on track to um, uh, ending the epidemic by 2030. And Look, you probably know more about TB than I do. I, this is normally the case when people ask me questions. But um, when, when, <clears throat> when I talk about TB, I think of it very, I sort of massively simplify it and think of it in terms of two sets of numbers. One is that roughly speaking, 10 million people a year fall ill with TB and only 6.4 million of them are diagnosed and treated. Surprise, surprise. If there are 3.6 million people in the world ill with a highly infectious disease and we're not diagnosing and treating them, we're not in command of the epidemic. So the immediate imperative is to close that gap. And actually, a lot of stuff was started in early 2018. Um, we had a catalytic investment fund where we sort of incentivized countries to do new and innovative ways of, instead of being passive on finding TB cases, proactively um, finding them. And actually, the early results on that are really encouraging. Um, the progress made in 2018 will be a multiple of the progress made in closing that gap of, of previous years. We need to sustain it, but at least we've got a, a new trajectory. The second set of numbers on um, uh, TB are the MDR-TB numbers. Um, crudely speaking, nearly 600, sorry, yes, multi-drug resistant TB, i.e. TB that does not respond to cheap and readily available drugs, but requires much more expensive drugs, which have often quite nasty side effects, and, um, and actually don't always cure um, the condition. Um, and the, 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 the facts of TB are pretty sober, um, MDR-TB are pretty sobering, right? It's the best part of 600,000 people um, have MDR-TB, and about a quarter of those are being diagnosed and treated. And, and sadly, the balance of those predominantly die. Um, um, and so there's massive underdiagnosis and massive um, undertreatment of MDR um, uh, TB. We have to step up um, the fight on both finding the MDR TB and then treating it more effectively. Um, and indeed, we have done quite a lot in recent months around the new treatment regimens for MDR-TB and, and enabling countries to, to switch to these better treatment regimens, which many of which were only approved um, in August 2018, and then there's some more, the BPAL stuff approved um, just this August. Um, but MDR-TB is something that I think from a global health security point of view, uh, we, need, we, we, we need as a global community to take much, much more seriously than we are uh, uh, at the moment. Again massively oversimplifying, but if you contrast with Ebola, it's just, yeah, roughly speaking, Ebola has a fatality rate of something over 50%. MDR-TB has a fatality rate of something over 50%. Ebola transmission is through bodily fluids. Um, MDR-TB is much easier to transmit. It's airborne water molecules. I'm afraid to say if I had it, I could give it to you. I would have to sort of rub you to give you uh, Ebola. There are 600,000 people in the world with MDR-TB. There are 2,000-ish with Ebola. I am not diminishing Ebola at all. Ebola is an extremely scary disease that it's absolutely right we mount a big response to. It does rather beg the question, though, of whether or not we are taking MDR-TB um, nearly seriously enough. Um, it's not even treated with it. It's not even done within the WHO emergencies program it's not thought of in the same way in many countries. It's sort of thought of as a nasty version of an old-fashioned disease. Um, I think we should think about it in a much, um, with a much greater sense of urgency, um, because uh, if you want, if you want to get, ex I mean, people talk about AMR, antimicrobial resistance. A third of the deaths of antimicrobial resistance are MDR um, TB. A bit of a, a well, call to action, note. <laughs> a call to action, nonetheless. And you've given people some food for thought. Plenty of that, um, Peter. Thank you. Thank you all. Please join me in thanking Peter Sands.